Okay, this is day two of, we're in Locktown, or lesson two at least. Um, it connects with lesson one in that the quiz that I wrote, that's at the very end of this, um, is going to ask you questions about two kinds by Amy Tan, as well as powder uh, by Tobias Wolf, and that's the one we're doing today. So make sure that you um, uh, either read or reread Amy Tan's two kinds to make sure that you got it and to check your answers on the answer key. Um, like last time, I'm going to be putting the, a copy of these notes for you to fill out. You can either fill them out online or print them out and fill them out at the bottom on the links. Um, and I'm also going to be putting the answer key there. So today, today we're going to do Tobias Wolf's uh, short story, Powder. He's one of my favorite authors. The link to the story is right here. Okay, Powder. Okay, uh, he's a really famous author and professor, and he's actually retired from Stanford. Um, and a fancier way to say that he's retired from Stanford is that he's an emeritus professor. I always have to really think about how to pronounce that word because it's not often used. It's one of those words that I tend to just read instead of um, needing to pronounce. Okay, so he's a retired professor from Stanford. He got a, an award from Obama, actually. Uh, I remember reading about this because I'm such a soccer and um, instead of being a fangirl over BTS, who I also enjoy, um, I'm a fangirl over authors. So, you know, I, <laughs> I, stalked Tobias Wolf enough to realize that he was getting this um, award from Obama and I was like yay I knew him I didn't I don't know him personally but I was a fan of his before he was super duper famous okay he's fairly famous for his short stories which we'll talk more about later um, as well as his memoirs He's done a couple of really famous memoirs, uh, and those tend to be historical accounts or biographies, stories that are told from a personal point of view. Some other really famous memoirs would be Angela's Ashes, if you're feeling like trapped at home and you want something that is both um, a book and a movie. Angela's Ashes is a quite, quite famous memoir, um, if you want something, and that's pretty depressing, and he actually opens it like that. Um, in Angela's Ashes, Frank McCourt talks about how if it was a happy story, why would you be reading about it anyway? Of course it was a miserable childhood. Why else would he write a story about it? Okay, um, And I would say overall that in terms of memoirs, there are very few that I can think of that are, you know, um, a little bit more hopeful. Maybe I Am Malala would be a more hopeful memoir. Okay, But This Boy's Life is uh, Tobias Wolf's memoir. And it was also made into a movie. It was made into a movie starring uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. I've got a link here to a, a YouTube trailer if you want to like see what that was like. Uh, it's very young pre-Titanic uh, um, Leonardo DiCaprio. And it's the story of Tobias Wolff's life which is a really fascinating story, okay? So you have to kind of know a little bit about his family background, which is that his parents had a very acrimonious divorce, okay? Uh, and that means that the divorce was very bitter and angry. And truthfully, my parents are divorced as well. It was also, I would say, an acrimonious divorce. It was a bitter and angry divorce. Um, but truthfully, I'm always a little perplexed when divorces are friendly. I've heard from some people that divorces can be friendly, and I'm not sure how that works, but I've seen it portrayed in movies. Uh, but basically, you know, he, his parents had this really terrible, bitter, acrimonious divorce. And they had two children. They had Tobias, who was five at the time, and they had Jeffrey, who was 12 at the time. So there was a seven-year age gap. And they basically decided, we hate each other. Mom and dad decided that. And so here's what we're going to do so that we never have to deal with each other again. You take one son, I'll take the other. Forget this. You know, some people have custody where you have to, like, arrange visits and or you, you know, every other weekend is with your mom or you know so on they said let's not do that you take one kid i'll take the other okay so tobias went to live with his mother and jeffrey went to live with his father and um they had very very different lives because of that okay and i'll say jeffrey wolf also became an author okay um this is you know how much it shaped both boys lives and he also wrote a memoir which was called the duke of deception which was about his kind of time with his dad and neither of them had neither of the brothers had a good time, I would say, after the divorce. I would argue that Tobias probably had a worse time and that his mother eventually uh, marries, the, remarries this man named Dwight, um, played by Robert De Niro beautifully in the movie. And, um, you know, Dwight and Tobias, who's going by the name Jack at this time, we'll talk about that more later, do not get along. That's like the understatement of the year. They do not, do not, do not get along. Most of the book, this book, not most, but a good proportion of the memoir of this boy's life is kind of about Dwight and uh, Tobias not getting along. 
And I think you can really see that from the dedication of the book. The, the front part of the book, the dedication, says my first stepfather, so that would be Dwight, used to say that what I didn't know would fill a book. Well, here it is, okay? Um, and, you know, Tobias Wolf is a very intelligent, educated, um, articulate man and author, but the tone of this is always like, yeah, you said I wasn't going to succeed. Look at me now. So I, I kind of love it. Um, I do feel a little bit bad for, for Dwight because uh, Dwight in real life was still alive when this book came out and he does not get portrayed well. Sorry that I had to adjust the camera. Okay, so anyway, let's look at some common themes that Tobias Wolf will go over in a lot of his stories. Um, one is this idea that everyday arguments about something stupid can seem actually really meaningful. Okay, and that small everyday agreements, uh, disagreements end up telling you something really meaningful and important. Okay, something meaningful, uh, important, something that you just can't get over about the other person. So I'll share a brief anecdote. Okay, so again, that's supposed to be a short story that's hopefully humorous. Apparently, I am um, British and I spelled it the British way in my notes. Sorry. Okay, um, so I'll tell you two anecdotes actually. Okay, uh, one is that when I I was a child and I was going back and forth between here and Taiwan, uh, my grandparents, two sets of grandparents would take turns um, taking care of me. And with one set of grandparents, she's actually still alive, she's 94, okay, um, she would braid my hair. I had long hair down to my waist and she would braid it. And one weekend, she went away to her friend's house, I think to play Mahjong. And so she left me with my grandfather, her husband, and said, take care of Christina. I was like five years old at the time, okay? And so my grandfather tried to braid my hair because he was like, how hard can this be braiding hair, right? And he got it terribly tangled. And being my grandfather, he was this former superintendent of schools. He was uh, quite the character, okay? Um, he, when it was really super tangled, my hair, he was like, you know, we, we can't untangle this. You've got really long hair, Christina, and it's too tangled to save, so let's just shave it off. Okay. So he shaved off my hair. I had, you know, five-year-old. I'm five years old. I have hair down to my waist. He shaves off all my hair. And, um, you know, I, I was a little bit shocked, but then, um, you know, he kind of said, don't worry, Christina. Okay. Um, he was a Buddhist. My other grandfather was a really big preacher, a Christian, but uh, this particular grandfather was Buddhist. And he would say, you know, and he said to me, Christina, don't worry. See how Buddha is bald and has a belly. Okay. And Buddha is happy. Right. And uh, now you're bald and you you have a belly. Okay, I didn't really have much of a belly. I was five. And you're happy. And so I was like, oh, I'm fine. I'm, I'm like Buddha. I'm happy. Okay. And I remember that my grandma came back from that trip and she like freaked out. I was five. So I was like, oh, I'm like Buddha now. I'm good. Um, but she never, I think, completely forgave my grandfather. And I remember decades later, Okay. My grandmother would say something like, you know, like they'd be fighting about something silly. Like, did you put down the bath, you know, the toilet seat or something like that? And she would say, this is just like that time when I left you alone with Christina and <laughs> you shaved her hair. Okay. And, and I, I realized that even though I had completely gotten over it by then, and I just thought it was a fun story. And even at the time, I mostly thought it was fun, except that everybody thought I was a boy for a little while, um, <clears throat> that this was meaningful to her, that, you know, she had entrusted her grandmother daughter with long hair to her husband and he had kind of failed okay um, I'll tell you another quick anecdote because that's also linked to a math problem and who knows what you guys are doing for math right now okay um, this is the Monty Hall problem and I remember so clearly in eighth grade uh, and you, you, you can watch this this is a very very famous probability problem I spent an entire lunch period arguing with my then algebra teacher okay about this Monty Hall problem and I was furious Okay. No matter how many times he explained it, I was like, you are wrong. I am right. And I am not going to leave until you admit that you are wrong. Uh, one of my good friends told me that I would forget. And I did actually forget this like a few weeks later. Okay. But, um, you know, it was one of those things where what I remembered then was that he was being unreasonable and he was wrong, my math teacher. But what I remember now is his wonderful patience for not kicking me out and for trying the entire lunch period to explain to me the Monty Hall problem, which um, I still have trouble with. Trouble with. 
I'd love for you guys to watch it. It's a very, very fun one. And you can let me know if you also think it breaks your head. It, it completely broke my eighth year old, uh, not eighth grade head. I completely broke my eighth grade mind. Okay, but it's this idea that these everyday arguments reveal a lot. For my grandmother, it was that I cannot trust you to braid your granddaughter's hair. hair. Uh, for my um, math teacher, uh, for me at least, it was that my math teacher was uh, amazingly patient and amazingly wonderful. <laughs> okay, um, and so Tobias Wolf is really good at writing these short stories where something normal happens, nothing like coronavirus. <laughs> okay, something really normal happens, a normal everyday conversation, and you get to the end of that conversation and you realize, I did not know you at all. Okay, so say yes is a perfect example. That story is linked right here. It's one of my favorites. If you get bored, um, you can read it or you can reread uh, re it if you've already read it. Um, and it's about a white married couple. Okay, so that's what would go in this blank. They're a white married couple who think that they have a really solid relationship. At the very beginning, the husband is helping the wife wash the dishes and he's like, look at me, I'm such a good husband. Okay, and then they start arguing about hypothetical situations. Situations, hypothetical, I can totally spell situations that you know could never happen right and a lot of couples have done this I've done a lot of these like if I die you know how soon before you be married to my husband would you still love me if I gained 500 pounds and just watched Netflix all day long okay we've all done these really stupid hypothetical questions and we've done them you know in the courtyard as well if you have, could have a superpower what would you have and so on okay so in particular this wife wants to know whether the husband would still have married her if she she had been black so they're both white and she says well what if I had been black and the husband says well you'd be a totally different person okay and he has a point right the fact that I'm Chinese is a big part of my identity even though I am both Chinese and American okay um, but she says well what if I was exactly the same person and black okay which also has a point you know who you fell in love with should be you know outside of um, you know your skin color etc and maybe some of the things that you attribute to to your cultural identity are part of something broader. So basically he says you'd be a totally different person if you were black and she says, well, you know, what if I was exactly the same? And the title of the story tells you that she wants him to say yes. She wants him to say, yes, if you were black, I would marry you. Yes, if you were 400 pounds, I would marry you. She doesn't say that one. That's the one I always say. Okay, but um, that's the short story. And it's a, it's a small, silly, everyday argument that they have. And they end up really learning a lot about each other that they probably didn't want to learn. Okay, so that's a common theme within his, within his writing. Another really common theme is this idea of acceptance and popularity. It's definitely something Jack, which is the nickname Tobias, because remember Tobias wrote this as a memoir, so it's about himself, it's about his childhood, okay? Uh, but he wants to go by Jack in the book. And in fact, he explains that he came up with the nickname Jack, okay? Uh, because he wanted to be associated more uh, closely with Jack London, who is this kind of man's man, um, if you've read uh, uh, White Fang, Call of the Wild, those are your kind of like Jack London books, okay? They're about man and the wilderness, and sometimes man versus wilderness, man fails, okay? So he, you know, calls himself Jack, uh, and part of the reason he calls himself Jack is because it's cooler to be associated with Jack London, and also because there had been a girl named Toby, Okay. Um, at his school, okay, and he was just horrified. They were apparently both horrified. I forget if it was Toby with an E or not, okay? So it's this idea that we will give ourselves nicknames. My nickname in high school was George, and I actually forget how I came up with that. Uh, it was supposed to be some clever play on words so that, you know, I could write down George has a crush on blank and nobody would know that it was Christina. Um, another example of this idea of acceptance and popularity would be his uh, short story, Smokers, which was actually the first short story Tobias Wolf ever published, okay? And it was about um, this kid who gets a scholarship um, to go to a private school and his desperate need to feel like he's making the right friends, the popular friends, and everything he does. And I feel like we've, we've all done that. We've all done things to make ourselves appear cooler than we really are, okay? Uh, and then also in the epitaph, so the kind of concluding part of this boy's life, the memoir, is a quote from a different author named Oscar Wilde and Oscar Wilde's quote is the first duty in life is to assume a pose to pretend to be cool to pretend to be whatever it is but the second is no one has yet discovered so Oscar Wilde is very very witty
Another common theme within um, just to, Tobias Wolf stuff, I would say, is optimism and hopefulness uh, despite adversity. So in this boy's life, Jack does everything wrong. Okay, he, um, you know, he cheats at archery practice. He lies to his mother. He does all these terrible things, and yet, you know, we know that he eventually grows up to be the guy who, you know, um, accepts the award from Obama. Okay, we know that he eventually grows up to be a professor at Stanford. So we know that despite all the hardships, he grew up to have a stable, lovely marriage, to be really, I would say, one of the best American short story authors, definitely who's alive and maybe ever, okay? So, you know, it's this idea that you can, not that you should go out and do bad things and lie to your mother, but this idea that sometimes you can really screw up quite a few times and still recover. You can learn from your mistakes, okay? Especially when you're honest about your mistakes. I think that that's really one of the things that is tremendously amazing about um, Tobias Wolf's life and his memoirs is that we all have the tendency to romanticize and over glamorize um, our past, right? We talk about the times we got the top score on a test or the, you know, we were voted um, homecoming queen or whatever it was. I was not homecoming queen, okay? But, um, you know, those are the stories that we emphasize and we don't talk about the time that, you know, we hid from a boy we had a crush on in the girl's bathroom, uh, true story, um, or any of the other silly things that we did. We tend to over emphasize all of the good things and not talk about the mistakes. And in this boy's life, it feels honest and raw in terms of the mistakes that he made as a you know younger gentleman, as a younger man, as a teenager, and what he learned from that. And I think that that's really part of the power is that he's able to say, this is where I screwed up and this is how I will be better. Okay. Uh, I also thought that this was particularly relevant right now, given everything that's happening, that there can be a good side. We can you know, um, make silly little videos or do our, do our part to try to make sure everybody's still moving on and, you know, moving forward. Okay, in this particular story, which is powder, okay, uh, the main idea is that a father and a son go skiing and they get in trouble. They get kind of stuck. The father is this irresponsible guy and he is always kind of, you know, at the beginning he's, he's, he sneaks his son into like a jazz concert. Um, he's always keeping the son out later than the mom wants him to be out. So you really get the sense that mom is the rules one who says this is when to be home and dad is the let's just have fun, let's go skiing. Okay. And um, you really get a sense of, you know, this mother and father, even though the mother never makes an appearance in the story, because the son ends up being a proxy for the mother. The son kind of says, hey, we're supposed to go home. Hey, let's be responsible. Okay. So that's kind of the idea in this particular story. Okay. So let's do some vocabulary. All right. So the first one is relent or relented. Okay. To relent is to abandon or mitigate and kind of make better or to give in. So from powder, Okay, um, he, he promised, so this is the dad, okay, uh, hand over heart to take good care of me and to have me home before, uh, before dinner on Christmas Eve, and she relented. So this means that, you know, he is kind of saying, please, please, can I take our son out to play? And the mom finally gives in and she says, okay, even though she clearly then doesn't want to. I know people who don't like to learn about current events because they think it's just uh, relentless, okay? Uh, bad news, which means constant bad news, the bad news that never gives up, the bad news that never gets in. Uh, it's also used in inspirational posters, okay, so where they say, be relentless, okay, like that means, you know, keep running, keep going, okay, um, and I, I used to um, help with a cross-country team, and I remember some of the women on that cross-country team were relentless, they would just run and run and run, it was amazing, okay, uh, and then lodge is another word that will show up in the story, a lodge is basically a house that was originally for a gatekeeper or groundskeeper, and which can now also mean a lodge like hotel that you can kind of like live in. A lodge always kind of has um, a certain look to it, I feel like. It's got this like rustic country look and I'm sure that there can be other ones but this is kind of what we kind of think of when we think of lodge. So they go to a ski lodge is the idea, okay? And then at one point, the uh, father says, criminy, um, which is just a word to express disbelief. And apparently it's a comic strip, which sometimes I, you know, double check definitions just to make sure I'm not crazy. And so there is a comic strip that looks vaguely like um, Animaniacs, okay? Um, that is called criminy. And then an Animaniacs was a great, um, uh, 
animated show if any of you guys are bored during the coronavirus lockdown. Uh, and then barricade is some kind of a barrier or blocking obstacle, something that bars you from where you are trying to go. So my children have at times tried erecting and building barricades um, into their rooms uh, by piling uh, pillows and chairs and blankets just because they think it's fun. There's also, um, I don't know why I got into this BTS thing. I um, had a student who was really into it and then I watched um, Chicken Noodle Soup, which is this, uh, it's a remake of a different song, but the Chicken Noodle Soup song um, is trilingual and as someone who is bilingual, so this is the original, okay, and then uh, the one with one guy, BTS, it's trilingual, it's got English, it's got Korean, it's got Spanish, uh, which means I can only understand maybe 50%, I can understand 100% of the English, I can understand half of the Spanish and zero of the Korean, but um, I just love it. I love that it is trilingual and I love that they put up these kinds of huge barricades so that people are not mobbing um, everybody from BTS. Okay, and then uh, scat I thought was a, used in an interesting word. We might use this uh, to mean scram. Sorry, there's a small typo there. Uh, like telling a cat to scat means telling it to go away. But in this story, we use it in the jazz way, and it's where you use your voice to imitate or um, you know pretend to be an instrument. So the people who are really good at this is pentatonics. I had a choir kid who actually recommended this to me, and they're they're really really amazing. So if you're looking for you know someone else to kind of discover. Um, they can really make their voices sound like instruments, like, um, you know, beat, well, all sorts of things. Really amazing. I, I, I can barely make an instrument sound like an instrument, okay? And then coerce or coercion, okay, uh, is when you try to, like, force someone to do something. So I might try to coerce my children into doing their chores because of timeouts, okay? Or through coercion, I might try to uh, get students to do more homework. Like, right now, I'm saying, even though it's coronavirus and lockdown and or shelter in place, um, you can still try to like get stuff done. All right, so then down here is the quiz. Um, and it's only, I think, uh, 12 questions long. It's mostly multiple choice. There's just one short answer. And it actually combines vocabulary that we went over in two kinds, as well as vocabulary we went over from powder. So I'll put a clean version of the notes down below, as well as a key down below. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.